So this is my Eurobrask the Hidden Commander deck, and this is a deck which I built after playing my Stonebrow Crojan Hero deck for a while, and I had a lot of fun with cards like Savage Beating and Gratuitous Violence, uh, these massive red bombs which can just sort of end the game in the blink of an eye uh, when your opponent's feeling all safe with their 30 or 40 life. So I decided to try and build an entire deck around big red cards, and this is sort of a deck I had in the works for a long time, sort of picking up cards here and there. Uh, I guess the reason it took me so long to build it was because I couldn't find a decent general for it. Uh, you know, there's some okay ones like a Chroma. Uh, you know, she's pretty good, but she doesn't really inspire an entire deck to be built around her in this way. She's more of a Voltron general. Uh, whereas I was looking for a general which could inspire the entire Big Red theme. Uh, so they finally printed Eurobrask, and I realized that this guy would be perfect as a general and he would inspire a deck to be built around him. Uh, since then I've discovered a couple other generals who would work as well, uh, namely Zerolin of the Claw and Adamaro First to Desire. Both of those guys are in this deck, and I think those would work as suitable generals for this kind of archetype. So, yeah, this is a mono-red deck. Uh, red is probably the worst color in the format for a number of reasons. Uh, most of it's you know, strong points which define it in other formats just don't translate very well into EDH. I'm talking about quick aggro strategies like, you know, Goblin Guide and stuff, and, you know, single target burn, lightning bolt, none of that really works very well in this format. So red loses a lot in the transition to 40 point life totals, and, uh, yeah, I think big red is one of the few strategies that really works for red in this format. So stuff like Insurrection, Savage Beating, uh, cards that can just sort of make an aggro strategy worthwhile. Uh, is one of the few ways you can make a red deck really work. Uh, I guess the other way you could do this is with a, a pressure deck. Uh, I'm thinking of generals like Ashland the Pilgrim or Zozu the Punisher, which are kind of like this deck, except they sort of aim to do incremental damage to every player at the board and end the game really quickly. Whereas this big red deck is meant to deal mass amounts of damage to one player at a time and sort of systematically take down each opponent one by one. Um, so yeah, this deck is built around really big creatures and really big red effects. And the aim of this deck is to deal as much damage as possible in one turn, because that's usually the best way you're going to make an aggro deck work. You need to catch an opponent off guard. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Eurobrask was chosen as the general, uh, because haste is the most important effect for an aggro deck. Uh, you need your creatures to have an effect the moment they hit the board, and they need to have an impact on your opponent's life total right away, or else they're just going to get hated off if you let four players take a turn before you get to swing with your creature. So yeah, it's built around big swingy red cards, and dealing tons of damage. I've got some red control cards in here. Uh, there's not very many of those, but I'm running what I can. And yeah, this is a really fun deck. I would recommend this if you like killing players. Um, but don't necessarily care if you win the whole table. It's the kind of deck where you'll like kill off three players and then flame out and die to the last player, whatever. Um, I would also recommend this if you want to build a cheap deck, because most of the important cards in this deck are a dollar or two. So I'll take you through this deck, and you know maybe you'll get some ideas for a big red deck of your own. So first I want to talk about the general Eurobrask. Uh, as you can see, his ability is all creatures you control have haste, and creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. He is a 4-4 four, four for 5. Um, so like I said, haste is the most important ability for an aggro deck in this format. Uh, you need your creatures to hit the battlefield and have an instant effect, otherwise they're going to die before you untap, particularly because you're playing the kind of creatures which are going to warp the game state because they're so strong, and they're going to scare people, so they're going to want to remove them as soon as possible. But if they're attacking the turn they come out, then, you know, they might not have mana open, they might not have a blocker. Uh, so I chose Eurobrask because he lets me have haste on my general. Um, if you're not going to use this guy, then you're pretty much going to have to run all the haste giving effects you can. You know, Lightning Greaves, Swiftfoot Boots, Hall of the Bandit Lord, In the Web of War, whatever you can, because haste is just so important for any aggro deck. So Eurobrask lets me sort of pass over all those haste cards because I can get this effect on my general. Because of that, I'm relying heavily on him. 
I'm going to want to keep him out as much as I can. Um, so, you know, I've had to recast this guy for 15, 17 mana because he keeps dying, and yet I need to have him on the board for the haste. Uh, it did take a people a while to wise up and realize that he's a huge threat, but yeah, um, he's only a 4-4 four, four for 5, which is kind of a shame. Uh, not a really good size for winning with general damage, doesn't really contribute to, you know, an aggro win unless I get some double strike effects down, uh, but he's a consistent beater, 4-4 four, four is not bad. Uh, his second ability here is actually really good because it sort of makes this deck immune to chump blockers. Um, it definitely screws people over. I guess the annoying thing is that it makes him look a lot more threatening than I want him to look. Uh, people sort of get really put off by that second ability and they end up killing him just for that. Uh, so sometimes I kind of wish it was just the haste effect and, you know, maybe make him a 5-5. Five five. But yeah, I'm going to want to keep this guy out uh, the entire game, hopefully, because I really rely on the haste and I want to try and get him on as quickly as possible. So first I'm going to look at all the creatures, and I'm only running about 25 in this deck, I guess. Uh, not as many as you would expect for an aggro build, but when you consider that most of the creatures in this deck are really high quality threats, um, you know, I really only need one or two creatures on the board to threaten a kill. So it's not like I need to run a ton of them. Uh, a lot of these creatures are pretty gigantic. So as you can see, the mana curve is quite high. There's a huge log jam at 6 and 8 and higher. Uh, so you can see how Eurobrask actually fits into the mana curve really nicely, costing 5. So I'm going to get him out on turn 5 and then get one of these hasty 6 cast and cost guys out the next turn. So that works out pretty well. Um, so yeah, my creature choices boil down to really aggressive cards which cause tons of damage or you know, a decent amount of damage plus some valuable utility. So if I can get, you know, a dragon who also has some creature removal on it, then that's definitely worth a spot. Um, if I'm playing a card strictly for aggro purposes, then, you know, I better deal a ton of damage. Um, also, I've got some smaller utility creatures. Not a whole lot, just because red does not have a whole lot of utility. Um, but I'm going to try and play a handful of control effects because, you know, you're going to need to deal with opponent's threats one way or another. So first I'll take a look at some of the utility creatures, and one of the things that red does really well is abuse players' mana bases, especially if they rely heavily on non-basics. So first we have Dwarven Miner and Dwarven Blast Miner, and they do essentially the same thing. They tap to destroy non-basic lands. Uh, this works well with Eurobrask because he gives them haste, so they can use these abilities right away. And this is one of the ways you can make a really lopsided board state if you get one of these guys out early, and they're, you know, busy playing their Ravnica bounce lands and, you know, come to play tri lands, whatever. They're going to lose those right away and lose a bunch of tempo. So these guys are definitely worth it in red decks. And then Magus of the Moon. Blood Moon on a stick is just a really ridiculous effect in any mono red deck. Uh, completely one sided, shuts the board down for multicolored decks. Uh, especially if they're getting greedy with the non basics. So this guy is just way too good. Uh, the cool thing about utility creatures like this is that I'm running a lot of effects like, you know, Rage Reflection, Pandemonium. So even like a 2-2 Dork is going to do a decent amount of damage if I have those enchantments out. So any creature counts. Next we have some utility creature removal. Uh, starting with Flame Tongue Kabu here. Um, not really a card you see in many decks. It only deals 4 damage. Like I said earlier, uh, targeted burn isn't great in this format. But I mean, there is a point at which it's not bad because, you know, creatures only have so much toughness. Uh, this isn't going to kill most of the fatties in this format, but most generals do have less than 4 toughness. They're usually utility creatures, uh, which have a whole deck built around them, so they're not usually beat sticks. Uh, so this guy is good for keeping stuff like that off the board. It's also a 4-2 four, for 4, so it's a pretty aggressively costed creature. And like I said before, any creature is going to do well in this deck, simply because I have so many double strike and pandemonium effects. And then duplicate, just an obvious choice for any deck. Um, it's especially good in this deck because I have so little removal, and because it's a really good beat stick. I was really disappointed they didn't reprint this in Scars of Mirrored and Block. 
or in any of the commander decks. Uh, that was pretty sad because it seemed like a very format defining card. Uh, some more random utility creatures here. Hoarding Dragon is not bad. 4-4 uh, four, four Flyer for 5 is okay. Um, but it gives red access to some uncommon tutoring effects. Uh, yeah, red usually doesn't have access to tutoring, which is one of the best best abilities in this format. So he's going to let me search for an artifact. Most of the time I'm going to go for Duplicant or Cage Sun or Steel Hulkite. Uh, or just some sort of random mana rock. Uh, the disappointing thing is that he has to go into my graveyard before I even get that card. So he's going to eat up a lot of Swords to Plowshares and stuff. Uh, Kiki Jiki, I'm not running any combos or shenanigans with him. Really, he's just here to copy dragons and copy utility creatures. So he's really good with Hoarding Dragon, obviously, and stuff like Flame Tank, Cavum, and Duplicant. Uh, you know, if I can get him with uh, Bogart and Hellkite or something, then that's perfect. Uh, he works really well with a lot of the Pandemonium effects I have in this deck, so he's mostly just an aggressive creature. And then Zerlin of the Claw. He's not really utility, because he's actually one of the most aggressive cards in the deck. Uh, but he also gives me access to creature destruction, like Bogart and Hellkite, artifact destruction, uh, because I have all those effects on dragons. I'm only running, I think, seven or eight dragons, but, you know, that's enough to make Zerlin work. Uh, yeah, unfortunately he exiles the card, so he doesn't actually work with Hoarding Dragon. But most of the time he's going to go for Dragon Tyrant. So for 5 mana plus 3 for his ability, that's a really big flying double striking creature. Um, Bogard and Hellkite, Steel Hellkite, really good options as well. Uh, this is probably one of the best cards in the deck, especially with Eurobrask's Haste, so I can use him the turn he comes out. And uh, he's awesome with Kiki Jiki because then I can, you know, double the creature that comes out. Uh, there is sort of an issue with him burning through the dragons in my deck too fast, but, you know, if I'm keeping him out all the time and getting dragons every turn, then I'm probably winning anyways. So yeah, don't overlook this card even if you're not going for a strict dragon theme because most of the best red cards in this format are dragons. So moving on to my aggressive creatures, uh, like I said before, I'm going to focus on creatures who can do tons of damage in one turn or else have, you know, decent damage output as well as some utility. Um, the really good creatures are the ones who are going to have uh, both. So starting with Living Inferno here, definitely an underused card. For 8 mana, we get an 8-5 with a sort of a arena ability here. Um, I like him in this deck because he's really good with haste. Your opponents don't have time to react to him. He's just going to come out and hopefully wipe their entire board, or maybe just kill off one or two annoying creatures and maybe stay alive. Uh, so he's decent removal, uh, sort of a one-sided sweep, but also a pretty aggressive creature. And then Morden Dragon. He's an example of one of those cards who can do really good damage as well as nuke some creatures on the board. So he's a 5-5 five, five flyer for 6, which is, you know, pretty standard as far as dragons go. Uh, fire Breathing is always a really good effect in this format because late in the game, with, you know, Cage Sun, Gauntlet of Power Road, you're going to have a ton of extra mana and you can sink it into one of your dragons on the board. Uh, his ability here is awesome because it can nuke some creatures as well. And Flame Blast Dragon, kind of a similar card. We've got a 5-5 five, five flyer for 6, and whenever he attacks, you can blaze. Uh, this one's really good because you can either nuke a creature or you can direct that damage at your opponent. And it's kind of cool because you can use this to nuke you know, whoever was planning to block the dragon, or you can just point a bunch of extra damage at their face and you know he doesn't even need to connect to deal that damage so both these creatures here, Morden Dragon, Flame Blast Dragon, pretty similar and they both do you know a ton of damage if they actually survive. Some more aggressive creatures which are capable of doing some extra burn uh, we have Inferno Titan here really good choice for red 6-6 six, six for 6 with fire breathing is very aggressive and then his ability here is going to nuke most of the utility creatures in this format and the fact that I get that every turn is amazing so with Kiki Jiki he's definitely a house uh, but you know he's going to kill off most generals and he's going to keep them off the board which is really annoying Borgard and Halkite, probably one of my favorite cards in red actually uh, you know a 5-5 five, five flyer for 8 is definitely not 
very aggressively costed, but Flash is so rare an effect for red, and it's nice to sort of have this ace up your sleeve every now and then. He's one of my favorite targets for Zero Lend because he can sort of generate this one-sided sweeper effect if they have a bunch of utility creatures or weenies on the board. Uh, he's great because he has a come into play ability, um, which I can, you know, double with Gratuitous Violence or Furnace of Wrath or something. So usually when I find a way to swing for 40 damage in one turn, it's going to involve casting this guy, giving him haste, and, you know, doubling all the damage he deals. So uh, a really, really good card in any red deck. And then Bosch Iron Golem, sort of an interesting choice. I was sort of toying around with whether it was worth it to go heavy artifacts for this guy. Um, I realize you don't really need a ton of artifacts to get the effect. 6-7 uh, Trampler for 8 is kind of a lot, you know, he's not that aggressive. But late in the game when I've got, you know, a Cage Sun out and some mana rocks, I have a ton of mana and a few artifacts on the table. And if I've sort of got a Gratuitous Violence or something out, then he can sort of flame out one player in one turn. Uh, I haven't really drawn him much, so I don't really know if he's actually going to work, but... I really want to try him out. I think it's going to be sort of an interesting strategy. Now we've got some dragons who can destroy some non-creature permanents. Horde Smelter Dragon, another 5-5 five, five flyer for 6. And his ability here is going to nuke artifacts and increase his toughness, uh, increase his power actually. So another aggressive creature who can keep some annoying permanents off the table. There's always a lot of artifacts to pick off, so uh, you know there's no shortage of fodder for him. Four mana is kind of a lot for his ability, I find, but, you know, after I cast him, I can usually activate it twice in one turn, uh, so I can deal a lot of damage and uh, get a pretty one-sided effect. And then Steel Hellkite, another 5-5 five, five flyer for 6, uh, with fire breathing as well, and then his ability here is just really, really good. Destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost X. Uh, this is important because I don't have many ways to deal with enchantments, and, you know, it's nice to get rid of creatures as well. So, another really good effect in this deck, and an aggressively costed creature as well. So, a couple more creatures here with some unique utility. Um, Conquering Manticore is another 5-5 five, five flyer for 6, and when he enters the battlefield, gain control of target creature and opponent controls until end of turn. Untap it, and it gains haste. So, this is one of those cards which gives me some unique utility, but it's also extremely aggressive. Um, if I have Eurobrask out, then he's going to attack the turn he comes out, along with my general and whichever creature I stole. So that's a really big life total swing on turn 6, usually. Um, but he's, you know, going to take blockers out of the way, he's going to grab Eldrazi, he's going to grab, you know, really dangerous creatures. Um, yeah, he's really good with Kiki-Jiki, obviously. He's a lot of fun. One of those cards that people rarely expect. And then Null Spine Dragon, one of those hidden gems for these mono red decks. Uh, he's not a 5 5 flyer for 6, he is a 7 5 for 7, uh, which makes him pretty aggressive in this deck. Uh, when he comes into play, you may discard your hand and draw cards equal to the damage dealt to target opponent this turn. So that's very interesting. Obviously, this deck deals lots of damage, and obviously, it is starved for card draw. So he sort of fits right in. Um, I guess. You know, the unfortunate part with this card is that he really discourages the haste theme because you're rarely going to want to cast him before combat. You're usually going to want to cast him afterwards. So, you know, that's worth it because I'm drawing a zillion cards for 7 mana. Uh, most of the time it's fine. Sometimes I can deal damage before combat, however, with like a acidic soil or something. Uh, draw a bucket load of cards. Yeah, uh, definitely a hidden gem for red. Uh, fits right into this deck, and it's one of the few ways I can draw some cards. Now we have some aggressive creatures which help make the rest of my board really aggressive. Um, usually I'm not going to have more than two creatures out. Usually my general and one or two other creatures will be fine. Um, but these guys sort of reward me for having as many out as I can. Halkai Charger, a 5-5 five, five flyer for 6 with haste and this ability which gives me extra attack phases. Obviously if I'm at the point where I can pay 7 to take extra attack phases, my opponents are in deep trouble. Especially if I have some other you know, damage doubling effect out, uh, he's gonna potentially win the game on his own. So definitely a dangerous card in this deck. Avatar of Slaughter, one of the new cards from the Commander set. Uh, for 8 mana we get an 8-8, eight, eight. all creatures have double strike and attack each turn of Fable. Haven't actually gotten a chance to play with this because it's obviously a fairly recent card. 
Um, but yeah, it looks really good. Double Strike is awesome in this deck, and forcing my opponent's creatures to attack, I don't know, potentially good. They're probably going to come after me, and I'm probably not going to have any blockers open, but whatever, that's what this deck does. Next we have some aggressive creatures who are purely aggressive, they serve no other purpose than to beat face, and these guys are obviously really good at it. So Adamo, first to Desire, one of the few early drops in this deck, and his ability here is very interesting, power and toughness equal to the number of cards in the hand of the opponent with the most cards in hand. Um, most of the time that's going to be 7, so he's going to come down on turn 3 as a 7-7 seven, seven most of the time. Uh, even in the late game, he's probably going to be a 7-7. Seven, seven. So he's incredibly aggressive. He is one of the ways I can end games very quickly. Drop him on turn 2 or 3, followed by Furnace of Wrath, swing for 14, blah blah blah. Um, he's one of the few aggressive cards in this entire format, which actually scales well with the format. So this is a format where people have lots of cards in hand, huge mana pools, lots of beat sticks, and he actually scales well into that format. So uh, I really like him. He would actually be a suitable general in a deck like this, uh, but you'd have to build in a lot of haste effects into that deck if you don't use your Abrask as a general. A Chroma, pretty obvious choice. 6-6 uh, six, six flyer for 8. Uh, the protection is awesome. I don't have very many creatures which protect themselves very well. Uh, protection from removal, counter spells. Uh, the fire breathing is great because uh, it's nice to sink my mana into her. And then she can come out attacking on turn 6, which is pretty solid. And then Dragon Tyrant. Just an awesome card in this deck. 10 mana is not that hard to get to when I have Cage Sun or Gauntlet of Power out. I do run a lot of mana Excel. Um, but the double strike is just insane with some of the stuff I can do in this deck. Uh, along with fire breathing, if I have a ton of mana to sink into him, he can one-shot players. He's mostly in here for zero loan with a claw, which is a really cheap way to sort of throw 26, 28 damage at someone very early in the game. So that's pretty hilarious. Obviously he benefits a lot from Eurobrask's haste, because otherwise he just sits on the board for a whole turn, waiting to get nuked, because no one wants to get swung at for 28. And then my last two creatures, Kozilek and Ulamog. These guys tend to go into a lot of decks I make. Pretty obvious choices because they give me some utility that red does not often have. Uh, card draw from Kozilek and permanent destruction on Ulamog. Um, but obviously the Annihilator works very well with your Rask's Haste. So that's a, a very good benefit. People will be caught off guard by having to sacrifice a bunch of permanents. So some huge card advantage from these guys, which is uncommon in this format for red and uh, just some really hard to deal with creatures. Um, usually don't have much trouble accelerating them out with my mana doublers. So moving on to the non-creature spells, uh, the first thing I want to look at are these gigantic red game changers, which are spells that sort of, you know, give me mass amounts of damage all in one turn. These are sort of the spells that I built the deck around because I love dealing 40 damage in one turn and cards like this definitely make that possible. So these three cards here all help increase the damage I deal. Uh, Rage Reflection here, creatures I control have double strike. Pretty straightforward. Uh, not an amazing card, they printed True Conviction like two sets after this, which was kind of a pain in the ass, but yeah, it's not bad. Uh, I play with gigantic creatures, so the double strike is usually huge. Uh, Gratuitous Violence, kind of a similar card. This one only costs five though, and it's all damage my creatures would deal. Uh, so that's important with Bogard and Hellkite, uh, Inferno Titan, Flame Tongue Cavu, etc. I've got a lot of creatures who can deal some non-combat damage, so that actually works out really well. Um, yeah, obviously that works with Pandemonium and stuff as well, since usually it's the creature that deals the damage when it comes into play. And then Furnace of Wrath. Definitely the best one, because it only costs 4, so I can get this out even sooner. Uh, the turn before I cast Eurobrask, in fact. Um, and it's any source, so this works well with Valakut, Earthquake, uh, some of my non-creatures which can actually deal some damage. Obviously the fact that it's symmetrical is the drawback, but, you know, I'm going to be the one abusing this card the most, not my opponents swinging with their Solemn Simulacrums or whatever. Uh, yeah, this card is a huge threat. Probably my favorite card in the deck, one of the most important effects in the deck. Uh, it's cards like this which is going to win the game for you. 
So next we have the pandemonium effects, and these are also really important to this deck because, you know, I want my creatures to deal damage the turn they come out because they have to have an effect on the board before they get nuked, and most of our creatures will only last a turn or two. So it's important to have the haste from Eurobrask as well as effects like these, which let them have a big impact the turn they come out. Um, so combined with the haste, that's uh, quite a lot of damage. Um, so starting with Pandemonium here, this one is symmetrical, but whenever any creature comes into play, that creature's controller may have it deal its damage to a creature or player. So these effects are all basically removal as well, since I can use them to nuke creatures, but a lot of the time I'm going to want to nuke the player's head uh, because I'm trying to kill them. Wear Ancient's Tread, this one only works for me. Um, the limitation is that it has to be a creature with power 5 or greater. Uh, unfortunately, Eurobrask is a 4-4. Four, four. This card would be a lot better if you were a 5-5. Five, five. But most of the creatures in this deck will work with Wear Ancient's Tread, so it's decent. You know, it's not amazing, but it's another Pandemonium. I think it's slightly better than Electropotence. And then they printed Warstorm Surge, which is great because it is only for me, which is important. Pandemonium sometimes results in Eurobrass getting killed uh, because other players get to have the effect on their creatures. This one will only work for me, and it will work for all of my creatures. So this one is definitely the most dangerous one. It does cost 6 mana though. Pandemonium is great because it comes out the turn before Eurobrask does. Some more big red game ending cards. Savage Beating, one of my favorite cards in red. Um, creatures I control gain double strike until end of turn, and if I untwine it, they get an additional attack phase. So that's basically quadruple strike for only 7 mana. That's usually enough to kill someone if I have 2 creatures out, maybe even 1 will do it. Uh, yeah, this is definitely one of the most dangerous cards in red, one of my favorite cards in the format. Aggravated Assault, uh, for 3 mana, get an enchantment that lets me repeat extra attack phases. This card actually draws a lot of hate, I find, even though, you know, it's not really efficient. You have to get 10 mana open before it really starts to become a problem. Uh, but yeah, definitely an aggressive card will win the game if people leave it alone. And then Insurrection, definitely a staple in red. Um, it is as good as ever because creatures are getting stronger and stronger and games keep getting bigger. So the more players at the table, the more creatures you will get. Definitely a game ender in red. Next we have some cards which are just really good at dealing a bunch of damage to my opponent's face. So Price of Progress and Acidic Soil. These ones sort of fit the pressure deck theme a little better because they deal so much damage to each opponent all at once. Um, but they definitely fit in this deck as well. Price of Progress is especially good because I run so few non-basics, so it's usually going to be pretty one-sided against those, you know, three-color decks or those two-color decks which get really greedy with the non-basics. So late in the game, this is going to deal upwards of 20 damage, and it's usually going to catch them off guard because they're feeling pretty safe with their life total, and this is a really good way to finish a bunch of players off at once. And then Acidic Soil is going to work well against those monocolor decks. Uh, especially those mono green ones which like to ramp up. Uh, this is a great late game finishing spell, uh, especially for those opponents who are sort of at dwindling life totals. And that's Sword of War and Peace. This is actually the only equipment in the deck. Um, because my threat density is mostly centered around creatures and I usually only need one or two out at a time, I'm not really relying on equipment to sort of increase those creatures because I have pandemonium and double strike effects to make those work better. Uh, but this card is sort of unique in that it's a purely aggressive sword which scales really well with the format because it deals damage equals the number of cards in hand, kind of like Atomaro. So I recently wrote a sort of rant about this card on MTG Salvation because I don't think it gets enough love in this format. Uh, one of the few aggressive cards which really works. And, you know, I like it a lot. It's the only way I can gain life, which is important if I'm getting nuked by my own pandemonium and protection from red and white, those are pretty good removal colors, so that helps. And yeah, it's just a really aggressive card. Uh, pretty cheap too, most of the cards in this deck will come out on turn 6 or later, but this comes out early, and attaches itself to Atomaro, and starts swinging for 14. So I really like this card in this deck. Moving on to some of my utility removal, Red does not have a lot of utility removal, but uh, there are some decent choices. Shattering Spree, this one's really good. For only one mana, you can shatter a first turn soul ring, 
And then later in the game, the replicate means I'm going to destroy all the artifacts on the board except for mine. Uh, which is really one-sided and pretty devastating because people run a lot of artifacts. Um, the replicate effect means that it basically cannot be countered because they can only counter one of the replications. Uh, Shattering Pulse, kind of a similar card in that it's a reusable artifact destruction. Um, it's a little costly because it costs 2 plus 3 to buy back, but if I can keep this going all game, it's definitely an annoying card. Kind of a useful one to have in hand. I'm going to pick off their mana rocks one by one usually. And then Aftershock and Chaos Warp. This is pretty good because it means that red has two Vindicate effects. Aftershock can take care of artifacts, creatures, and lands. Uh, no enchantments, but there usually aren't too many of those kicking around. Uh, so Aftershock obviously fits into any red deck. And then the brand new Chaos Warp from the Commander expansion. The owner of target permanent shuffles it into his or her library, then reveals the top card of his or her library. If it's a permanent, he puts it into play. Uh, so this is obviously really good against generals, since it is a red way to tuck generals permanently. Um, it's obviously any good against any permanent, because I can blow up enchantments, planeswalkers, whatever. Uh, it's also just a very fun card, because, you know, who knows what can happen with this. Sometimes they get something even worse. A lot of the time it's just going to be a land or a non-permanent spell, which means that Chaos Warp has been very good. Uh, I like this card a lot. It shows some promise for this format, actually, because it means that they're finding creative ways to sort of warp the color pie. Red doesn't usually get Vindicates because it's off-color, but they found a way to give Red a good commander card while not going too far off-color. So uh, if they keep doing this, then Red can definitely catch up to the other colors. Moving on to some mass removal. Uh, Red has some pretty decent mass removal, like Obliterator, Jokel Hops, or however the hell you pronounce that. Um, but I'm just going with the classic Oblivion Stone and Nebuchadnezzar's Disc, uh, because I'm not really interested in blowing up all the lands. Uh, Oblivion Stone is obviously better than Disc most of the time, because it doesn't come into play tapped, so we can use it right away. Uh, disc will sometimes give them a whole turn to prepare. Uh, but these are both important, because it'll let me destroy stuff like enchantments and creatures, which red usually has a bit of trouble with. And then all his dust is similar, uh, does not take out artifacts, which is unfortunate, but uh, it is a sorcery which I can blow up the board with for only 7 mana. And then I'm running Earthquake. There are, you know, like a hundred different Earthquake effects in red, and they're all, you know, pretty playable in this format. I've only got room for one of these, and I chose to go with the classic Earthquake. Uh, the reason I like this one is because it's cheap, you know, just red and X, and I play this as, you know, spot removal to take out one utility creature on the board, or I'll use it to sweep the board of all the non-flying creatures, which is usually pretty one-sided because I'm running so many flyers. And it's also good to just nuke all the players on the board. So, you know, this will work as once, you know, like a Wrath of God, or it'll be a spot removal spell, or it'll be like another acidic soil basically. So it's actually a pretty versatile card. It fits a lot of roles in this deck. I'm trying to find room for a second earthquake effect. Maybe uh, Molten Disaster actually looks pretty good with the split second. But yeah, don't underestimate the earthquake effects in red because they're actually pretty solid. I didn't want to go overboard on the land destruction, but these two cards here are just a bit too good to pass up. They're both really one-sided in this deck because they hate on non-basics. So Ruination for 4 mana, destroy all non-basic lands. Uh, that's always going to hurt my opponents more than me, and for the really greedy players, this is going to completely wipe out their lands. And then Blood Moon, uh, the same as Magus of the Moon, this is going to shut out their mana, uh, really punish the greedy players. Uh, yeah, I think these two cards were just too good to pass up. I'm not going with any... Decree of Annihilation or Boom or Bust, which you might play in other aggressive decks, uh, because I just didn't really feel like focusing on those. And then I've got some card draw effects. Red does not have access to much card draw, so you're going to have to make do with some pretty subpar cards. Um, Sensei's Divine Top, obviously not subpar. Uh, it's really good to be able to set up your draws, especially when you need to hit all of your land drops early game. And then Crystal Ball, obviously not a Sensei's Divining Top, but it's definitely solid. I like it in red decks and other decks that have trouble drawing cards. Uh, scrying, late in the game, this is, 
can sometimes be better than Sensei's Divine Top because it's nice to put those dead mountains on the bottom of the on the bottom of the deck and you're better off drawing gas at that point. So you want to hit more dragons and more more cards that actually do stuff. So I really like Crystal Ball in a deck like this. And then Wheel of Fortune, probably the best red card in EDH. Uh, all players must discard their hands and draw seven new cards. Yeah, it's it's really, really good. Uh, so red has one card draw spell, and it's probably one of the best ones in the format, I think. Uh, Mind's Eye, another artifact way to draw cards. Pretty good in a multiplayer format. I find this gets hated off the board really quickly, but if you can get three or four cards off it before then, then it, it probably did its job as best as it can. Uh, this can definitely get out of hand if you have a lot of mana kicking around, but if your deck is working the way it should, you probably won't have a lot of mana kicking around. And then red gets a random tutor, so Gamble is really good in this format. Uh, this will usually go for a first turn soul ring, or a, I guess a second turn soul ring. Or later in the game I'll use this to grab Furnace of Wrath or Savage Beating, something I can finish off my opponents with. So uh, definitely a good card in this deck. And lastly the Mana Rocks. Because my mana curve is so high, I run seven of these, pretty good. Uh, yeah, I want all the best ones in here. Soul Ring, uh, Mana Vault, Everflowing Chalice. Yeah, that's not very good, but, uh, you know, I can't afford the super expensive ones. Worn Power Stone, again, pretty lousy, but cards like this are just going to help me accelerate into a six casting cost dragon on turn four. So, you know, Everflowing Chalice, Worn Power Stone, they're not that bad. Thran Dynamo, Gauntlet of Power, obviously wants me to play lots of mountains, and then Cage Sun which, interesting, interestingly enough, will work with non-basic red lands. Moving on to the lands, um, I'm running 40 lands, which is maybe on the high side, considering how many mana rocks I have, but considering what my mana curve is like, uh, you know, it's definitely what I would consider a reasonable number. Uh, I haven't put a lot of work into acquiring the best non-basics, um, but, you know, I've got some... Uh, the base is covered. I've got some land destruction with Dust Bowl and Strip Mine, some cycling lands, uh, random Temple of the False God. Hall of the Bandalore, this will usually be the most important land in an aggressive deck, uh, but because my general gives my creatures haste, uh, this is usually just a plan B. It's a really good plan B because Eurobrask does die a lot, and I really like to have my creatures hasty. Um, so this is good, but sometimes it's just going to be doing nothing. Uh, random Homeward Path, and the best ones, Spine Rock Knoll, a really good hideaway land because 7 damage is really easy to get to, and because most of the time I'm going to be casting a very expensive card with this, so that works really well in this deck. And then Valakut is a, a real gem in this deck. Lightning Bolt isn't good, but getting one every turn is really good, especially if I'm doubling the effect with a Furnace of Wrath. And then 31 basic mountains. Woohoo. Oh, 7th edition. Sweet. Uh, so that's the deck. And the game plan for this deck is pretty straightforward. For the first few turns, you're really not going to be doing much. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll hit one of your early mana rocks so that you can start pumping out big creatures as quickly as possible. Or you can grab a dwarf or Magus of the Moon and start, you know, controlling people's mana bases really early. Uh, or if you're lucky, you can get Adamaro out, and he's going to start swinging for 7 on turn 3 or 4. Uh, but basically, you really want to get Eurobrask out as quickly as possible, and keep him out for the whole game, because you're really relying on his haste, uh, he makes the rest of your creatures so much better, and, you know, he's, he's good at keeping blockers at bay as well with his second ability. So people are going to try and kill him, depending on how smart your, your opponents are, they're going to realize that he's a lot scarier than he looks, uh, so you want to try and keep him out. I didn't go with any Lightning Greaves or anything, because it's sort of redundant with the haste. Um, but, you know, if you can protect him, then go for it. But uh, I just prefer to keep recasting him, because people will get bored of killing him eventually. Furnace of Wrath and Pandemonium. These are my favorite cards to drop on turn 4, because they make Eurobrask so much better. And uh, they really sort of define the, the deck. I'm going for sort of a blitz strategy, which is going to do ridiculous amounts of damage all in one turn, and uh, these are the kind of effects that really make that possible. Um, 
So one of the best creatures you can drop in this deck is Zerulin because he's going to give you access to some ridiculous dragons. Um, but from then on you're just going to sort of drop some really good creatures. Uh, like I said, I like creatures who have some removal tacked onto them as well as some very aggressive uh, aggro abilities. Uh, but also creatures which just sort of deal ridiculous amounts of damage without necessarily having any utility. Those are good too, as long as they're good enough. Uh, so we are going to run some control effects because you will have to deal with your opponent's permanence. So stuff like Chaos Warp, Oblivion Stone, these are really necessary even in an aggressive deck. And then you're going to have to come up with some creative ways to make up for Red's shortcomings. So no ways to deal with enchantments, no ways to draw cards, uh, no ways to tutor. You can sort of make up for this with some strange cards like Wheel of Fortune or uh, some colorless cards like Mind's Eye and Ulamog. Uh, there's lots of ways to end this game. Um, if you're just using you know, your big creatures, they might not get there on their own. You're going to have to sort of help them along with something like Gratuitous Violence, Rage Reflection, or Warstorm Surge. Uh, you can also finish the game off with a non-creature like Sword of War and Peace or Acidic Soil or one of these beasts down here, like Insurrection, uh, Savage Beating, or just a big Earthquake will do it. Uh, so that's the whole deck. Uh, I really urge you to sort of give this deck a try because it's probably the funnest deck I've, I've had in a while. I really like pulling this out when I just sort of want to throw some big creatures on the board and destroy some people. Uh, not really a politics deck unless you consider do this or I'll kill you politics, but uh, <laughs> it's fun to sort of put the fear of God in people when you're playing a mono red deck because mono red isn't known for being especially powerful. But uh, this is a deck that will definitely scare people. So uh, give it a try. Maybe put something together uh, with your brass or some other general that you think will work and uh, see if you get any ideas from this one. So thanks for watching.